Welcome to the Marriage Through a Gospel Lens podcast. This is Pastor Matt O'Mealy, and this podcast is a recording of our Sunday School's teaching and discussion. Our class is for engaged and newlywed couples, where we focus on exegetical teaching and spiritual disciplines through the lens of marriage. To become one in marriage, so let's learn how to lean into that reality in our personal discipleship and how we build our families on the truth of God's Word. Join us as we study and discuss the Bible together as couples. Okay, so Mark 10, 1 through 31. Last week we talked about uh, verses 1 through 12, which I labeled as a kingdom reflection of marriage. And overall, these three sections, I saw they were highlighting some countercultural kingdom values. If you remember last week, Jesus was um, being challenged by some Pharisees, trying to get him caught in a controversial argument, so to speak, and he... <clears throat> Proved them that, or to them that uh, they were missing the point in the first place, and so that was not not at all what was most important. Because they were trying to figure out uh, how they could uh, trap him, and they asked him, uh, "What about dis- or, uh, so dis- what about divorce?" And then Jesus says, "What did Moses command?" And then they start trying to talk about what Moses gave excuses for or exceptions for, and Jesus goes into talking about the law and the purpose of marriage and uh, really changed, changed the discussion from there. And the big takeaway was, like, did they actually answer the question? No. Is divorce actually acceptable? No. Does God make exceptions for sin because humans are broken? And when you put two humans together, then there's a lot of brokenness? Like, yes, but it's still against God's plan. So this is, uh, that was a kingdom reflection of marriage that God has uh, some intentions and uh, we should always be aiming for what God's intentions are on things. And today we're going to look at a couple more sections here, a kingdom reflection of faith, verses 1 through <clears throat> 16. So I, or 1, uh, 13, 13 through 16. I will go ahead and read that. It says, And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child, shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying hands on them. So, this is, you go back a chapter, Jesus dealt with uh, some children in the previous chapter, and talking about uh, what is important in the kingdom of God, right, by using the the child as an example of, of what it looks like to receive people who are the least of these, who are not as important. So remember back to that, that was in the middle of chapter 9. So today we have uh, people bringing children to Jesus to be blessed. Who was bringing the children? Who do you think was bringing the children to Jesus? Their parents? Yeah, their parents. Possibly older siblings, relatives. Their family, essentially. Yeah, probably. It doesn't say, but we're assuming, because we're trying to think through, oh, hey, Joel. Trying to think through, uh, why would they be bringing them? Was it a good thing that they were bringing children to Jesus? Well, I mean, I would want my child to be around the Messiah. Because <laughs> they, they need him as much as we know. That's fair. Yeah. Do you think they... What do you think they were wanting to accomplish bringing their children to Jesus? Bless and have a good life. Yeah. So is that a bad thing for parents to want their kids to have a good life? I guess no. But so, so, yeah, but why were the disciples annoyed? Because they're stupid children. What do they know? Yeah, <laughs> the disciples are stupid children? Or? <laughs> I'm thinking why is Jesus wasting his time with these little children? Yeah. They're not even old enough to comprehend what he's going to do for them, so... Yeah. I need to waste time with him. Yeah, that's that sounds likely. At that point, did the disciples really see Jesus as more like healing people and helping those who had physical needs oh, right. more than just spiritual needs? Well, he had, you know, he had healed the paralytic man, and uh, what else do we have? The, the woman who's bleeding, and yeah, there, there's been a lot of physical healings. Um, 
But I think I think it's showing a lack of their understanding. Someone was pointing that out. A lack of their understanding more than anything. Even if, you know, the a lot of the crowds were they following Jesus because he was the Messiah or because man, something interesting is happening, maybe something good will happen for me. Probably more more along those lines, uh, for the most part, but you can't fault the parents for wanting something good to happen for their kids. Uh, it says, though, in verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. Why was Jesus annoyed? Can you define indignant for me, please? Yeah, like he's uh, frustrated at the situation and frustrated towards those causing the situation. Uh so I think I think it is pointing out more, I would say relationally, like the way I would use that word or the way I think it's being used here, that it's not just I'm annoyed at the situation, but it's like I'm indignant, like this is mine says displeased. Yeah, like this is kind of getting in the way. This is not what I want to happen. And but why was he annoyed? It's why was he indignant? It's like do not hinder or what what's the thing where you cause another man to stumble or something like that. Don't hurt other people's mm -hmm. faith in you. Well, that was the stuff in chapter 9. Right. You so know, he's like he, mad at the disciples. He's like, do not yeah. even dare get in between me and these children. Yeah. I think what he had an issue with it, with kids already, the Jesus one, he already had to tell them. Like, uh-huh. Let him come. Yeah, he already had to explain his his it's feelings towards, mm -hmm. towards kids. Like whenever all the people were trying to come see mm -hmm. Jesus, after he was trying to relax and all the disciples were like, everybody get away. And he was like, hey, no, no, no. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was looking at some commentaries and stuff, and they point out that Jesus, you can tell he's annoyed because he also gives a double command. It says, let them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. So it's the, either one of those would suffice on its own. Uh, but, but he said both. He says uh, a double command here, do not uh, stop them. Let them come. So Jesus, he's welcoming the children because, as he's already said in the previous chapter, that uh, the kingdom of God uh, or God's spiritual rule in people's lives, it is for everyone. It belongs to everyone, as he said. It belongs to such as these. All children, uh, or everyone, including children, who come to Jesus uh, and they come in a childlike faith and dependence on God are given free access to Jesus. And so uh, there is no one who is unworthy of coming to Jesus, you know, regardless of their status or intelligence or age or whatever, uh, Jesus wants everyone to come to him. So how did the disciples already miss this point that Jesus just made in chapter 9? How are they, how did they already mess this up when Jesus already used the children as an object lesson previously, and then here they are dropping the ball? Let's just put our minds in the disciples there for a second. How did they already miss that? I think their mindset genuinely was like about wanting to have Jesus back, like look out yeah. for him, whatever. If he's resting, like let him rest, whatever. But yeah. they're still, I think they might be, I don't know, maybe wrapped up in that so much that they do miss, like he's told them before. Yeah. If they're coming, like don't stop them, you know? Yeah. I think there's this constant struggle that the disciples <laughs> are constantly dealing with not understanding fully the mission of Jesus on earth and like I just think immediately to the Beatitudes that's around the mountain he says blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of God is theirs mm -hmm. like he's literally saying this is the children the kingdom of God is theirs and that he literally came for those who were you know oppressed bringing justice and to the disciples they were so focused on like they were still struggling with that mighty like ruler who was going to come yeah. and just defeat like you know this terrible the Roman Empire and all this stuff and, and they, they just didn't understand his mission and I think that's the struggle that they're having yeah I think you're right and I think on the other side of that is uh, as we talked about last week and looking at the role of children in Greek and Jewish society is they were not thought highly of until they were of age etc cetera, etc cetera. And so it's probably also just a natural knee-jerk reaction. They already are struggling with the mentality of who is the Messiah and, and, and what is supposed to be happening. And then this other class of people, these children are being brought, and they're like, wait, 
you're not good enough for the, what they perceived as what should be going on. And so I, they're still just struggling with those things. And so we can, you know, look at that and be like, oh, you dumb disciples uh, and think of it that way. But we struggle with a similar thing. You know, it's, it's hard to get over just culturally ingrained thoughts about other people, even when we do as Jesus already showed them previously, this is not the right way to think about it. It's still hard for us to get over that. And so, you know, give them a little grace, give us a little grace and continue to work on that. It's not a one and done thing when you learn a lesson where it's like, oh, learn the lesson. I'll never mess up on that again. We know that's not how that works. And so the disciples are still struggling with this idea of, uh, of who deserves faith and what faith looks like and who can come towards that. And the lesson is everyone. Everyone is is able to be saved. What is different, though, about this lesson regarding the children uh, being brought to him in faith and then the previous one where Jesus was using them as an example? What do you think is different between those two? What was the story of how he used this example? It was in chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 33, when they were arguing about who's the most, who's the greatest. I think it's um, Jesus is showing not just with words now, but with actions mm. what he was talking about what he really needs. Yeah, I think so too. Also, like, it kind of helps you understand his frustration too because he had previously told him, like, those who welcome these kids on my behalf, like, welcome me. And then uh-huh. they're like, not welcoming these kids. And he's like, Guys, I just told you yep. like what this is. Yep. Yeah, so Jesus is in this moment showing that these these children are being brought just like uh you know who else is brought? It's the the broken and the unhealthy and the demon possessed, all those all those that that need Jesus. We've seen examples of those being brought. Uh so Jesus is using that illustration of a child that they are worthy of him. And then also that they're not the ones that are, they're not pursuing prestige and power. They're being brought humbly to be blessed by the Messiah. And so they, they are uh, related lessons, but they, there are some differences there that we can learn more about what, uh, what's going on here. So what does this reveal then, brought more broadly thinking about the gospel, thinking about this lesson? How we try to determine who's worthy of the gospel. Mm. I mean, just think that Jesus' words when he's speaking to his like hometown and he's like, you know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and you know, I come to you know set free the captives and, and the oppressed, and this very like it makes me think about our calling in the gospel of being involved in justice about yeah. how, you know, maybe it's not little children in our scenario because in our culture, you know, children probably are valued differently mm. than in this time centuries ago. But who in our culture do we say, well, you're you're not good enough to come to Jesus. Like, we're good, you know, we can we deserve, you know, his forgiveness and his love. But you, I mean, not so much. Right. So on a personal level, we see that God's kingdom is not gained by human achievement or our merits, or what we do or don't know, or who we do or don't know, uh, because the kingdom is for such as these, right? The least of these, the children, the sick, whatever, that Jesus was uh, preaching the the kingdom of heaven to. So we're seeing that the, the kingdom is for everyone, and that there is no one special way that is better than another, as long as it all goes to Jesus and humility and recognizing who he is and the fact that he's Lord and and you bring nothing to the table. Uh, I don't know if you guys were there, you know, not everyone uh, comes to reach, but we, the first time that Kiva and I were here and we led uh, communion at reach on a Tuesday night, uh, we we do it uh, in a different way sometimes where we tear off the bread and, and dip it in wine. And one of the things that we picked up grape in our, juice. or grape juice, yeah, 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 wine, grape juice, you know what I mean, uh, or both, uh, try a little both there. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that we picked up in our church planning travels was uh, there's these different traditions where 
when you come, there's we've been to some where you reach out and you grab and you tear and you dip it. But then we heard someone else in a different church tradition, they pointed out the fact that you don't reach out and grab Jesus. He is handed to you. And so you come with empty hands, bringing nothing to the table, and the Lord gives you everything that you could possibly need. And so in that scenario for communion, the pastor tears off, or whoever is serving tears off the bread and places it in, in your hands. And it's just that idea of uh, it is not my merit or me grasping at heaven, at salvation that, that brings me to heaven. It is the fact that God gives me everything. I come empty-handed to this table. Uh, and, and Jesus has, has and is everything that I could possibly need. And so we see a kingdom reflection of faith here in this story. So moving on, with that in mind, this builds directly on it. I'm not going to write all this again. <laughs> So we have a kingdom reflection of discipleship. And we're going to go 1831, right? Pretty sure? Dead gum. 17. Thanks for having my back. All right, 17 to 31 here. It says, And he was setting out on his journey. Uh, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have. Give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but with God, uh, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So, a kingdom reflection of discipleship. You see the rich young ruler coming to, come to Jesus asking what he must do to be saved. How is this story of a man's attitude that is contrasting these kingdom principles that are that Jesus taught. How uh, how do you think that this came about? You see, the rich young man he's illustrating exactly the opposite of what Jesus was just talking about. He's failing to acknowledge his own inability to find and receive eternal life. He seemed very well versed in the law already at this point, but he seemed to lack one important answer. Why do you think he lacked one important answer? What did his question reveal about his lack of understanding? He thought he could earn it. He thought he could earn it. He said, what must I do? Yeah, what must I do? What must I accomplish? Thinking a little bit more deeply about his internal turmoil, what do you think that reveals about the position that puts him in? He has to work his entire life. Yeah. He doesn't ever get to experience freedom. It shows that he feels insecure in that. Because if there's always more to be done, always sin to be atoned for, he has a feeling of insecurity about his destiny. What was the motivation of a person, this rich young ruler, who seemed so excited to run up to Jesus and then was turned away. What was his motivation? Why was he so easily defeated in this interaction? Because he thought he had done it. 
What? Because he thought he had done it. Yeah. He's going to tell Jesus. He's going to ask this question and then impress Jesus. Ah. Look at Jesus here. Look at my good deeds. And Jesus went, yes, all of your filthy rags. Yeah. You think he, you think he was thinking he was going to get a pat on the back? Yeah, maybe. I think it's also like when we think about our own lives that Jesus was able to look at, I think specifically, I bet that man had known from that he should be doing that. Like I just kind of think of, we know the sin struggles in our own life that we want to avoid surrendering to the Lord. Hmm. And I feel like he was probably defeated to like hear what he may have already known. And yeah. dang, I actually have to... It's like people saying, like, I don't want to come to church because I don't want them to, like, judge me. And it's like, okay, well, you hear the argument, like, you're, you should come to church, but, like, it's not judgment. But we can't promise that, like, you won't be changed because that's mm -hmm. the purpose of church. And so I just kind of look at that as, like, you know, I can go to God and say, like, look at how much I've improved in, like, mm -hmm. the sin areas and this, 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 and this. And he's like, yes, but there's still this. And you're like, I knew that. Yeah. Tell me yeah. <laughs> yeah. He had a. Uh, so it was interesting because because Jesus uh, challenged him right away because he used the word good, and uh, it's not just that Jesus was correcting him. And this this is a lot of things. It was Jesus kind of doing a bit of a turn of a phrase to point out that you know he's not saying you're wrong in calling me good, but only God is good. And so yes, we can look at it and go. So Jesus is saying I'm I'm good. He's not saying don't call me good. I'm not good. Only God's good. He's saying why do you call me good? Only God's good, right? So he, there is that, the fact that Jesus is, uh, in a turn of a phrase, accepting the, the being called of good. But also Jesus is using it as an example, the fact that this man had a faulty perception of what good is. Is it just actions? That's why Jesus is challenging it. He's pointing it out that only God is perfect, which is it illustrates then that he's pointing out that this man who does lots of good things is still lacking in the good department. So it's it's a both and. Uh, yeah, so, Jesus is good. He is he also God. Only called him teacher. Yeah, and then he came back around and he's like, "Oh, I got corrected," and so he only calls him teacher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh, what does? What was it? Um, I lost my page on there. I don't know. It's when Jesus says he loves him. Or that he looks at him on love. What verse is that? 21. 21. Yeah, yeah. So Jesus looks at him and loved him. Why does it say that Jesus loved him? Because if you didn't love him, you wouldn't have told him the truth. Ooh. Snap. What was that? Yeah. Tell him the hard truth. Yeah. This is unique to the Mark account. And it's also just unique in general. Normally, it says Jesus looks on them with compassion, or et cetera, et cetera, those types of things. But he looked on him and loved him, and he wasn't he wasn't coming down on him hard. He was kind of being like, "Yeah, you've you've done well. There's more. You know, there's more that you lack." Uh, because he was challenging him on on what he thought was good, but it was just interesting that he looked on him with love, because there's that paradox of unconditional love still requiring a response of faith. Because like Lauren said, it's not the fact that coming to church and coming to Christ means you have to do stuff. It means God's got to do stuff. Coming to faith, God God does the work. He's the one who's good. He's the one who's, who's accomplishing those things. No doubt Jesus loved all that he interacted with in all these stories we've read so far in Mark, as he loves everyone who he's made that are in his image. He loves everyone. And that's never changed from the beginning of time, regardless of how much sin we've done. Jesus loves those that are made in his image. We also know that scripture says that the gospel is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. This man would have been a, a Jewish rich young ruler, and he was very pious. And as a pious Jew, he wanted to confirm that he was on the road to eternal life as anyone else would. Uh, and it is the one like this who carries this burden of performance that the gospel is meant to bring relief to, because you don't have to carry the performance. Jesus is the one carrying the performance. This is such a contrast to the previous story about Jesus wanting to accept the least of these, the children in that example, 
And then man coming, look how great I am. And Jesus is like, not great enough. You know, there's still more to be done. And the man turns away sad. And it's not because Jesus was giving him more commands and saying there's more that he has to be done. It's just pointing out that, that you're not good enough. But Jesus is good enough. So there is a big contrast here. Um, what was the contrast then in thinking about the commands that he said he had already followed and then the one that challenged him that he turned away sad about? What was the contrast between these commands, the ones he said he already did and the one that he was sad about? I think he could do the commands before in comfort. Like, mm. And this last command is going to cause you to lose the comfort of money and the comfort of your home and all those things. And so I think the last command is truly like, okay, now that you've done, like, you've treated others with respect or love, or that's kind of what I see in the other, in the other commands. But um, now you, if you want to receive eternal, like, if you want to be in eternal life with me, the kingdom of heaven, like, you should die the things of this world. Mm. And the money is primarily one of those things. Yeah. So it's going to cost them something. Like something real tangible. Uh, yeah, that is that is difficult. By selling all that he had, the rich young man would have to learn to shift his dependence to God uh, and not to his own his own doing. Jesus wanted his heart. And it's really, he says in the Sermon on the Mount, mm-hmm. you know, that where your treasure is, there your heart is. Like, and yeah. he's, he's calling out, like because I think we can easily translate this and be like, well, but it's wrong to be rich. But in reality... Jesus is saying, give me your heart. Yeah. You know, give all those things up and then submit your heart to me. Yeah. He, he wasn't willing. So thinking back to the basics of the like the Ten Commandments, where does the where does the sin come in? Oh yeah, in the back there. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say like the ones that he says that he doesn't do, uh-huh. they're like all people oriented. Yeah. The command of like Go and sell your possessions kind of like encompass the four commandments that have to do with our relationship with God. Uh-huh. So it's like he's accomplishing like what he can do with other people, but he hasn't quite met that threshold of like surrendering his whole life to Christ. Yeah. Because he's putting, like like you said, like he's depending on himself to be <coughs> for himself rather than depending on God. And so like he's kind of missed the point of the first for because wealth is his God. Yep, exactly. Yeah, he's he has made his wealth and that comfort his idol. That was his idolatry. So he was turned away sad because Jesus pointed out that he still had this idol sitting sitting in his heart, in his home. And uh, yeah, the, the things that he said he did, those were the easy to verify external things. Uh, well, he hasn't been divorced. Uh, he doesn't hate his parents and he's done these other, like, good. So all easily verifiable external things. And uh, like Sam said, the you know money's not necessarily bad, but it's how we treat money and how we view money. And so in his instance, it was it was an idol. Boiling it down even further to the greatest commandment, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, if money is an idol, if comfort is an idol in your life, you are not loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In, in Jesus' um list of the commandments he also doesn't list um, the last one um, don't cover your neighbors wealth or anything mm-hmm. yeah jesus didn't list that yeah he didn't list that. yeah and that's why because that was the that in this scenario would tie it back to his idolatry yeah. so he's like oh yeah i've done all those things have you <laughs> it's like yeah yeah let's look a little bit further yeah exactly that that is a direct line there so in this idea of how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God, this question that's posed, uh, what is the contrast between the previous lesson of childlike faith and the point that we see here of the rich young ruler? Children don't understand the concept of money, like, to put in one way or another. So yeah. Children have this sort of... Worldly value escapes them in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. And as you know, adults and human beings, we get more and more complex about, oh, I need... Mean, food to live, I need water to live. Children mm-hmm. just, they're uninhibited in, yeah. in their love, I think. Yeah. Be a way to put that. Well, going back to what Sam brought up, the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and the attitude that Jesus is talking about, the kingdom attitude of, don't worry about what you'll eat or drink, you know, 
God takes care of the flowers of the field, the birds. Doesn't he care about these such things? So that's a lesson really for adults. Kids can also learn it as well, but it really hits home for an adult who thinks they're self-sufficient and they got to do X, Y, and Z, otherwise they're not going to make it. Uh, so yeah, that that is a huge challenge for that. Uh, the thing that he points out, the unnecessary uh, or the necessary thing was this unrivaled allegiance to God in replacement of his allegiance to what he could accomplish on his own about what he thought had worldly value. So he was breaking, uh, as Becca pointed out, lots of commandments with just this one aspect of idolatry. So this question, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God? Uh, wealthy humans tend to put their trust in their own resources, their own abilities, instead of God. Um, this is a, a shocking statement, no matter what culture we're in, and especially in their culture, it really would have stood out because uh, in contrast to how all other religions or any sort of philosophies view things, salvation is a free gift that is given through the accomplishment of what Jesus did on the cross. And it's for anyone who responds to faith. The problem is when we think we can somehow deserve or, or level up to a better position of deserving that free gift. And we see over and over that there is no special level for that. It's for the demon-possessed crazy people and the lepers and the unclean, the lowly children, the outcasts of society, even the rich young ruler who has everything. It's for him if he would just lay down his idols. We would be better if I were, if I were, it would be easier in this scenario if our relationship with God was difficult and hard so that we could use our pride and take pride in it. But that's not a reality. Right? We wish that it would be that way. And, and even you guys are talking about uh, in your testimony of growing up in the church and feeling a, a sense of, of legalism and, and that's just how things are. We would, we would like that because then it would be a checklist, something that we could earn and we would feel better about that. But that's not what Jesus calls us to. He calls us to the humility and the example of the children who come empty-handed knowing that Jesus is going to give them everything and I bring nothing to the table. That's why it's such an interesting contrast that Mark put those two stories right next to each other. Re reiterating his previous two lessons about children, Jesus is then using the children as the example of what it looks like to be a believer. He even calls them, the disciples asking these questions, he calls them little children as they're asking these questions. So what does the disciples' question then reveal about their worldview and their understanding? I think that they're still stuck in a status mindset on earth and just yeah. I mean they were oops, like some of them were fishermen and barely mm. making it and they look at this guy who has it all together and they're like, if he can't be saved, yeah, just based off his life, like who can't be? Mm -hmm. I don't think that they're still missing the point in that sense. They're just he just says status isn't what matters, so yeah. anyone can be saved. And that was a big thing in Jewish culture, I believe. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but like if you were well off, it was because God was must yes. be blessing you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and yeah. So they're like, uh, yeah. That's where they're like amazed because they're like, wait, this is kind of attainable. Like, you yeah. know, because I'm like, you were saying like they're poor fishermen uh -huh. and so on and so forth. They think the favor of God is equal to the favor of man. Uh huh. Yeah. Which the Old Testament, if you look at certain things in a vacuum, it would look like that. But when you look at things more broadly, that's that's not the reality. Uh, because God says, you know, I'll, I'll bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you. There seems to be like a A plus B equals C type of a situation with the, the, with the reality. But then what does God say through the prophet uh, Micah? Like, he's told you, oh man, what is good? To, was it, walk humbly with the Lord? To... Love, seek justice and love justice. Like, no, it's not. God's told you what is good. Don't screw up and be really impressive. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Old Testament says. There's an interesting quote I have here from C.S. Lewis. Uh, in looking at these verses, <clears throat> this was his reflection. He says, Christ said, blessed are the poor, and how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom. And no doubt he 
primarily meant the economically rich and economically poor, but do not his words also apply to another kind of riches and poverty? One of the dangers of having a lot of money is that you may be quite satisfied with the kinds of happiness money can give, and so fail to realize your need for God. If everything seems to come simply by signing checks, you may forget that you are at every moment totally dependent on God. Now, quite plainly, natural gifts carry with them a similar danger. If you have sound nerves and intelligence and health and popularity and a good up upbringing, you are likely to be quite satisfied with your character as it is. Why, why drag God into it, you may ask? A certain level of good conduct comes fairly easily to you. You are not one of those wretched creatures who are always being tripped up by sex or, he says, dipsomania. We had to Google that. That's alcoholism. <laughs> uh, or nervousness or a bad temper. Everyone says you are a nice chap, and between ourselves, you agree with them. You are quite likely to believe that all this niceness is your own doing, and you may easily not feel the need for any better kind of goodness. Often, people who have all these kinds of natural uh, goodness cannot be brought to recognize their need for Christ at all. One day, the natural goodness lets them down, and their self-satisfaction self is shattered. In other words, it's hard for those who are rich, in this sense, to enter the kingdom. I see that a lot in Bible Belt America, <clears throat> because we're satisfied in our own natural goodness. But that will let us down. And ultimately, when it comes to eternity, as this example with this interaction with the rich ruler, that lets us down. It's still not good enough, because we're not good enough. Only Jesus is. So when it comes to roadblocks for salvation, what can't God overcome? Why is it difficult for a man to overcome roadblocks to salvation? And what does, this is a multi-part question, <laughs> what does all things are possible then for God entail? So thinking about roadblocks, what can't God overcome? Why are roadblocks such a difficulty for us? Why can God overcome everything? I think for me personally, like I operate in our current society mindset. So like, okay, you're really asking me to get rid of everything I own. I would, my thought would be, and even just with tithing and like making sure that we're continuing to hold our money with open hands. Mm -hmm. If you think about if God really asked me to sell everything I own, like he did this man, I would be like, okay, then how are you going to provide? But, like, in just thinking, of, but he could literally have someone walk up to you and say, here's five bucks, go eat, or something. Yeah. And so I just think of, I try and think of humanity's means of making something happen and forgetting that he operates completely outside of yeah. the means that we, he could literally make you feel full without you even having to eat or something, you know? Like, his methods for doing, for accomplishing things are, like, way outside of my comprehension yeah and yeah I try and like work through how things can work out in my own head it's like they'll make it happen in a completely different way than I could ever plan you know yeah yeah uh in that what you're talking about is the idea of faith being that I will have faith if I also get to have a backup plan that I'm comfortable with <laughs> and that's not what God's calling us to you're right that's a that is a roadblock to faith for sure so what does it mean that with God all things are possible? You trust him. Yeah. Yeah. But with, with that though, we're we're children. If you look at it, we're children. We're faced with the roadblock, the lesson that God's probably trying to teach us in that. Yeah. Whether it's endurance or giving your hands up, whatever the case may be, it's always a lesson that He's trying to teach us. Yeah. So that's given up in a way we have to face it. We have to trust in him. Or trust in him, he'll get us through. Yeah. Whether that's physical things, spiritual things, emotional things, the brokenness of other things around us, with God all things are possible. It's beyond our ability to achieve these things, but not God. Nothing, nothing that we do is independently on us in the first place. That's what Jesus is pointing out here. My mind goes to always the easiest, big, big obvious contrast of like a 
convict on death row. Like, can he be saved, a convict on death row? Yes, right? We talked about that last week with divorce. Like, it's not a black mark and you're just, well, I guess you're not going to heaven now. Like, that's not how any of this works. Anyone can be saved. Nothing is impossible with God. So if they can be saved, why do we think we could out God? Or out lack faith in the midst of God's goodness towards us? Uh, this is... This is, uh, I think, one of the huge parts of this lesson is that this man walked away not wanting to, in faith, release his idol, and that is the challenge for us. And uh, there's an interesting thing here in Mark. He uses the word with persecution. He's talking about the blessings that we will get. It's only in Mark, and most likely it's Jesus referring to the fact that uh, this is this is contrary to world values. We're talking about... Uh, kingdom values, kingdom reflections of the values of heaven, and this type of life, this type of faith, this type of laying down things is going to contrast the world, and you will get good things, but not without persecution. Is it good things only in this life? No. This is not health, wealth, and prosperity. But uh, there will be difficulties, but what does Jesus wrap up with at the very end in verse 31? What is the kingdom principle but many who are first will be last, and the last first. What does that mean? I feel like it's just referring to how upside down. Yeah. Like, and complete opposite the world's concepts and God's concepts. Yeah, the upside down kingdom of the kingdom values. Yeah, absolutely. Jesus is the first among servants. He's the, he's the lead servant. That's why one of his last acts was washing the disciples' feet. It's like, hey, what's the grossest job I can do? Cool, I'll do that job to prove to you that that is the kingdom value. So, in what? And then dying. Yeah, and then dying, a uh, death he didn't deserve. So in our context of young families, newlyweds, engaged couples, how can your marriage uh, how can in your marriage, how can you encourage your spouse to come to Jesus with a heart of humility in thinking about the example of the children? How can you encourage your spouse to come to Jesus with a heart of humility? Mm. You reflect Jesus in the way you serve them. Yeah. Yeah. And that you don't put yourself above them. Yeah. Very good. Anyone else? I think, like, for me, I'm encouraged by Jake when he is running towards the Lord in a certain area of our life, and I have a hard check of, like, oh, well, I don't want to do that, like, or I have, like, a, uh, I don't know, mm. and it's a check moment for me of, like, where's that coming from, you know, like, am I holding on to this too tightly, like, my time or money or whatever, and so I think just by, like, being honest with each other about how we feel about something, and yeah. you can tell in my face my reactions to things, and I'm like, you know, I don't know why I'm feeling that way, but I need to figure that out, you know, and so I think as long as we're both, I think you can hold each other accountable, like you said, with being servant hearted towards one another, and also as long as you're both running after Jesus, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you of things along mm. the way, as long as you're in tune with each other. Yeah. If you're both following Christ, then you share the same spirit. Uh, So yeah, as you encourage one another towards humility, um, I think that that sin nature that wants to well up and be like, hey, wait a second, that's that red flag, that's the light on the dash, where you're like, ah, that's that's probably my problem. (laughs) We need to check ourselves. So how do you then keep each other in check in regards to heart issues that are behind things like what the rich young ruler is dealing with here when it comes to riches and resources. How do you keep one another in check to have kingdom values, kingdom reflections? Yeah. I'd say something that we've started to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can say the place if you want me to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but something that we, this is like an extreme problem, I think, that we, we started really trying to do Sunday meeting together we're on Sunday nights. It's like our schedule check-in, emotional check-in. Um, but within that time, 
we have discussions about money and possessions and things and it's been really a place of accountability for both of us because I have realized how I store up treasures here and um, it's challenged me the way that we've had conversations of like hey we need to give away more like this is something that we have to pull ourselves out of um, but like that's like literally a practical thing that like literally like we have a scheduled conversation on Sunday nights to talk about things and like what where, what area in our life are we not giving to God yeah. and how can we talk about this but yeah. that's just a little thing that we've we've started to do you're not experts but that would be good going with a completely different direction I uh, when I heard you ask that question my thought was just like which is just what I've been told because I'm only there in month and can't tell you how it works. <laughs> but um, I've just heard a lot of like you, you love the Lord and you obey Him and you do your job and you don't you don't change your spouse and you don't try to like act in a way that it's like oh well, I'm doing this because I'm trying to tell you something like if yeah. I'm obeying the Lord and I'm loving God and I'm not thinking about all of the I'm not poking at the stick while I have a log in my eye yeah you know that concept yeah yeah you're not loudly reading your Bible in the morning flip Flip. Yeah, I'm reading my Bible. Yeah, <laughs> which is being being faithful and doing it. Yeah, waking him up by doing dishes. Like I'm doing my chores. You know. <laughs> yeah, being being faithful uh, with it. Is that a laugh of conviction? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, you're right. The, because we've mentioned this several times in our context of marriage, I can't force my wife. To have better faith i can't coerce her into salvation or my children or anyone for that matter us being faithful in re regardless of what's going on around us is the biggest testimony we could possibly do that's that's the biggest thing we can muster as a mere human following jesus in faith is no matter what's happening if we like him try and remain consistent and constant and faithful all those things that are a fruit of the Spirit, though, we've mentioned that before in here, I think, that the fruits of the Spirit, they are things that happen when? In conflict. If everything's chill and nothing bad is happening, do you have to struggle to be patient or self-controlled or loving? No. The fruit of the Spirit, all are things that happen in conflict. So in the middle of difficulty and conflict, whether it's with each other or just with each other going through life as a couple, if we are consistent and constant in our walk with Christ, and we see the fruits of the Spirit growing in us, that is the biggest thing we could possibly do when it comes to our testimony and our witness, uh, whether that's to one another or to those that God has sovereignly placed us around as a couple, as a ministry force that God has intentionally brought together. Definitely so, praying for your spouse. That's a, praying a for your spouse. And not praying, I know, crazy. <laughs> like, and not praying of like, God, you need to change them because, you know, but not yeah. coming. Like, come to God and say, like, I'm frustrated, and then pray for them as God's child. So like this is your child and you love them and you want a relationship with them you know and then praying on like for them in that behalf um and then asking god to open doors for your like show me when to shut my mouth and not say anything and be patient yeah um because yeah you cannot change your spouse just like you can't really even change yourselves um and only god can so allow god to do that work in them and then be there for support be there as a listening ear and not say i told you so <laughs> you know like afterwards but to love and serve them through it sorry you see the people. with that i will pray <laughs> heavenly father i thank you for our time together this morning i thank you for the testimony of uh, dalton kennedy and uh, the new life that they have found in you and the new family that they have created together that is being built on the gospel. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning, the example we see of Christ uh, reaching out to even the least of these in their context of looking at little children and the faith that they have coming to him uh, in contrast with those that feel like they have it all together. 
that their abilities or their wealth or whatever uh, makes them good enough. Lord, there's nothing we can do to be good enough. Only you are good enough. And I pray that as young families that are growing and uh, trying to, to build ourselves upon the gospel, I pray that we will always have that heart of humility and faith to reach out to you for all that we could possibly need. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. The goal of this podcast and our Sunday school is to encourage couples to study the Bible together and form their families through a gospel lens. Thank you for listening, and I pray you found this encouraging in your own walk with Jesus Christ. The Marriage Through a Gospel Lens podcast is available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. This podcast is a ministry of Evergreen Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and is meant to be an encouragement for couples to anchor their discipleship and their relationship on the Word of God. For more information and lessons, please visit our website at evergreenbc.org.